Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multidimensional RPG podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 180 of Game Master's Journey. I'm your host, Lex Starwalker. On this show, we discuss the craft and the art of game mastering. I've been running RPGs for over 25 years now, and I produce this show in the hopes that you can benefit from my experience, my triumphs, and my mistakes. I've got a great show for you today. This episode today is the bonus episode for September. So every month I do a bonus episode in addition to the regular weekly episodes. And this is something I do uh, as a thank you to the patrons and and because of the support of the patrons. This was a milestone that we hit on the Patreon. So, So this episode in your ear holes right now is because of the patrons. So thank you, patrons. So today, I I try to do something a little special with these episodes every month, so they're not just another episode of the show. And today, I'm going to do what I call micro-topics, which are topics that I want to talk about on the show, but that I don't necessarily want to devote an entire episode to. So I have quite a few of those that that have been piling up. Um, Some of them have been piling up for quite a while. Uh, but we'll see how many of those uh, topics we, we can get through today. So I can't even tell you right now what, what they're going to be because I have no idea how much of this we're going to get through. We're, we're just going to play it by ear and, uh, and see how we do. So um, just real quickly, uh, just a few announcements here at the beginning of the show. I want to remind you that you can get a Game Master's Journey t-shirt. You can find a link to our store on Spreadshirt over at the website starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey. We also, in addition to our community over on Google+, Plus, where you can hang out with other listener GMs, we have a Discord server now. Uh, so you can go hang out in our Discord server. You can use the text chat. You can use the voice chat and hang out with other listener GMs, ask questions, um, give advice, tell your, your RPG stories, all that good stuff. So you can find a link to our discord server in the show notes over at starwalkerstudios.com. And I want to send a huge thank you to listener GM Eric for your donation on the website. Thank you so much, Eric. I, I really appreciate your support and, uh, I'll just, Take this this opportunity to remind you that, that one of the many ways that you can support the show is uh, by a one-time donation. So if you don't want to make the commitment to become a patron, you can do what Eric did and just make a one-time donation. And that is awesome, too. Well, I've got a lot of stuff to talk about today, so let's get to it. All right, I got some feedback on episode 170 of the show uh, on our website from listener GM Chris. And uh, you know what? I have to actually refresh my memory here. What episode 170 even was? Wow, that was so long ago. Such a long time ago. (laughs) Uh, That was one of our uh, West Marches episodes. Let's see. Episode 170 was... Uh, West March's campaign variants. So I did a three episode series on West March's style campaigns. And this was the third of the series in which I talked about uh, some different variations that I thought of that that you could use for a West March's campaign. So listener GM Chris uh, commented on episode 170 on the website. And Chris says, I've been really enjoying these series of episodes on West March's campaigns. I just happened to have signed up for a West March's style Edge of the Empire campaign. Now, that sounds cool. And uh, just a quick aside, I I think it's awesome that people are using this concept in non-fantasy games, which is awesome. Although you could argue that Star Wars is fantasy, but, but let's not get into that can of worms. 
Uh, so, so Chris says, didn't know what it was. And then I happened to listen to your podcast. One question I have and something you did allude to in one of the episodes is how do you handle ensuring that the party returns to town or wherever the safe zone is at the end of a session? Or is that even necessary? Since you have no way of knowing when you will next run a session for a particular group, it seems you wouldn't want to leave them hanging. You mentioned something about scrolls of teleport. I'd appreciate it if you'd elaborate on this a bit. I really enjoy your podcast. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for writing in, and and I'm glad you enjoy the show. So real quickly, for any of you that, that maybe didn't hear the West Marches episodes, uh, what Chris is referring to here is part of the idea uh, behind the West Marches co- concept is that you actually have a pool of players, more players than what you would have at a, at a game table for a given session, and that every session uses different players and even different characters from this pool of players and characters. So in order to make that work, one of the things that you try to do in a West Marshes campaign is to make your uh, game sessions um, or, or make your adventures, single session adventures, the idea being that at the end of every game session, you should be able to get all the player characters back to the town or the home base, whatever that is, so that it's kind of back to this reset ready state so that the next session, if you have totally different players or characters, it doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about, oh, my character's out in the wilderness and can't go in this adventure. So so the idea is every session, you end the session with the player characters returning to town. Now, obviously, that that can be challenging, making every game session this kind of almost like a like the old serialized styles of of TV shows where each episode is its own self-contained thing. And you could even, you know, play episodes out of order and it didn't matter because they were all their their own self-contained thing. So that's the kind of thing you're trying to do with the West Marches campaign, just so that um you don't run into a situation where you have some players and and characters that are off away somewhere in the middle of something. And now they can't go on the adventure you're doing tonight because their character isn't available. So, so if you can wrap everything up at the end of the session, every time get everybody back to town, then, you know, everybody's in town in between sessions and you don't have to worry about that. And also it facilitates trading of information between players and characters that went on the last adventure and those that didn't because well they're all all the characters are hanging out in town so they can hang out and and tell the others what they what they experienced so um the the first thing i can say about this is this whole idea of getting the group back to town at the end of every game session really only matters if you're using that large pool of players. So if you're doing a a more traditional approach where you have a fixed group of players and characters that play every week, then there's really no need or reason to worry about getting them back to town at the end of every session. The only reason that's even a thing is because you have this large pool of players and you don't want there to be any um, issues with having a completely different group of players and characters in the next session than what you had in in this session. So, you know, if you don't have the the large pool of players, then you don't need to worry about it. It it doesn't matter. But let's say you do have the the pool of players. And and so you don't know uh, which players are going to be in the next session. So you're, you're wanting to get everybody back to town every time. Um, so how how would how would I approach that? Um, so the the first way and kind of the most obvious is to make sure to plan your encounters and and your adventure sites in such a way that that they can be completed in a single session. Now, single session is going to mean different things based on your situation. You know, some of us play three hour sessions, some of us play four hour sessions, some of us play eight hour sessions, some of us play 12 hour sessions, right? So, so you got to think about, you know, how, how much can you really realistically accomplish in a given session? You know, if I have a three hour game session, um, it's probably not realistic to think that we're going to get through five encounters 
in that session. Plus, you know, time for, you know, other things like getting to and from the adventure site and role playing or shopping or, or whatever. So, you know, that can be pretty tricky, right? And it takes some experience to know or, or have some idea of how much can we do in the time that we have, whether that's three hours, four hours, eight hours, whatever. Um, so it's, it's really just a thing of, of one planning and also adjusting during the session. You know, maybe if you're running out of time, you don't do it, do a, another random encounter or whatever. Um, but you know, as, as someone who's run sessions before where, where there's a time limit, um, even if you have an adventure that was designed with that in mind, uh, it, it can be tricky because it's really ultimately impossible to know how long anything is going to take. Cause you never know how much the, the players are going to role play or, or how much time is going to be taken up with, with all the things that can happen at the table. So it's difficult. And I, I would say, um, that's probably one of the more difficult aspects of running this kind of campaign. If you're using the pool players is, is being able to consistently every week come up with things for them to do that they can actually accomplish in a single session. And, you know, I personally, I think if I were to do a campaign like this, I would find that very difficult because I tend to uh, think more kind of longer term and 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 pretty much any idea I, I come up with for like a story arc or an adventure or anything like that or a dungeon or anything like that is going to take more than three or four hours to do. It's going to take more than a single session. So so I would find that very challenging if I had that that large pool of players. So another way that you can help yourself with this, other than just in the design of the encounters and the, the adventures, is, and this is kind of what Chris was referring to here when, when we were talking about um, Scrolls of Teleport, is coming up with a way for the player characters to get back to town more quickly. So, you know, obviously you could do this using a spell or a magic item. So if they're high enough level that they have access to teleport or teleportation circle or, or something like that, then obviously they, they can use that to to get back, assuming they have that spell prepared. Um, or you could give them some kind of a magic item. So that could be a consumable item um, or it could be a permanent item. So a consumable item could be a scroll which is not only consumable, not only can a scroll only be used once, but it's also a fairly limited magic item because only a spellcaster uh, can can use it. And I think perhaps I'd, I'd have to look at the rules to be sure, but I think it might even be that only a spellcaster who has that spell on their spell list, not not the spells that they know, but all but their class spell list, like all the spells that they could potentially know. Um, I'm not sure. If you're a wizard, for instance, if you can use a scroll that has a cleric spell on it, I don't think that you can. I think it has to be a spell that's on your spell list. Um, now, if it's a spell that's of a higher level than what you can cast, you you have to make a roll to to use it. So, so a scroll, not only is it consumable, so you can only use it once, but it's also a little more limited than, say, a potion, because only certain characters are going to be able to use that scroll of teleport. So if your party doesn't have any spell casters, a scroll of teleport isn't going to do them a whole lot of good. So the, the other way you could go is, is a more uh, permanent magic item. And, and this could be an item that can just teleport them back to town whenever they want. It could have a cooldown so they can only use it once a day or they can only use it once every three days or or after they use it, they they have to do something to recharge it or something like that. Um, or it could be an actual magic item that will only work once, but will work for everyone or anyone and not just, you know, like a scroll where only a caster can use it. So, um, you know, that's that's something you could consider is giving them some some kind of item like that. Um, now, another way you could approach it is, you you know, you could say like, we don't have to worry about necessarily getting you back to town in the session. We just need to worry about getting you through the end of the last encounter during the session. And then we can kind of hand wave the whole you getting back to town. And, and that happens, 
you know, basically after we're done playing after the session is over. Um, the only issue with that is that that eliminates any possibility of something happening on on the way back. And a big part of the theme of the West Marches is the the danger of of the wilderness. And, you know, you're kind of diluting that theme if you're letting the player characters return to town at the end of every session without any encounters or any chance for random encounters or any chance of getting lost or, or anything interesting happening. If you're just hand waving it at the end of every session, you know, um, it's going to require a little bit more suspension of disbelief on the part of the players to understand that, well, we're hand waving this because of time constraints, but this is still a dangerous thing. And, you know, you can't assume that just because at the end of every session you get back to town with no incident, that every time you go out and travel in the wilderness, there's no incident. And, And personally, I wouldn't do that for that reason, because that's too much kind of fudging around with, what's real in the game for my, for my liking. So, so I personally wouldn't consider that as, as an option until the player characters got to the level where just wandering around the wilderness isn't in itself a challenge anymore. So they have the teleport spell, right? So if the group has access to teleport through an item or, or a player can cast it, then I, I feel comfortable hand waving it because it's like, well, unless something happens right before they teleport, then, you know, it's a pretty much a guaranteed safe trip. Um, so, yeah, you know, so, so that's another way that, that you could approach it. And, you know, just my, my big caution with the hand waving thing is, is that at the lower levels, um, just wandering through the wilderness and not getting lost and having food and water and avoiding encounters with things that you can't handle or don't want to handle is a big part of the challenge of the campaign. And so if you're if you're either hand waving that away because you're hand waving them getting back to town or you're giving them some some way to teleport or something like that or low level or you're giving them flying mounts or something like that. um, Just understand that you're kind of removing that challenge, which is a big part of the campaign, at least at lower levels. Now, again, as the, the player characters advance in levels, these challenges start to drop away because they can create food and water. They have various options to navigate magically. Um, They have ways to travel magically. So once those things start um, becoming available and those, those things are no longer a challenge and they just become bookkeeping, then you stop worrying about it. Right. So, so, you know, it's like, this is how I often handle ammunition in my games. You know, with a first level character, it's like, yeah, you're going to count your arrows (laughs) You're going to keep track of how many arrows you have and how many you use and and all that good stuff. Because at first level, that's something that matters because 20 arrows costs, I think, a gold piece, which, you know, isn't a lot of money. But to a first level character, I mean, you don't have a lot of gold. You can't just say, oh, I've got limitless supply of arrows. It's like, no, you have however many arrows you bought and that's all there is. But as you get higher and higher level, um, that ceases mattering as much you know eventually the the player characters have enough money that they could literally say hey while i'm in town i'm gonna buy a thousand arrows or however many arrows i can buy every town i go to i buy them out of all the arrows that they have and i just have so many arrows that i'm never going to run out and and that isn't even really a cost to the player it's like they're spending pocket change for that And, and so once the campaign gets to that point i tend to stop worrying about tracking ammunition unless it's magical ammunition. So, you know, it's that same kind of of concept with things like random encounters while traveling, um, natural hazards you might encounter, like quicksand or rock slides or things like that. Because again, you know, once you're a certain level of power, quicksand is just an annoyance. It's no longer a real threat. So if it's not a threat, why, why waste time with it? Right. You could just narrate, Oh, you guys encountered some quicksand, but you levitated over it or whatever, mark off a spell slot or whatever, you know, and and just move on. It's not worth spending game time. Like, Oh, we're going to, how do you guys get out of the quicksand? Because it's like, it's not a challenge anymore. So, you know, how you approach this can vary depending on what level uh, your player characters are at. 
And finally, my, my last thought on, on how to approach this is let's say you um, let, let's say you want to do an, a series of encounters or an adventure site or an actual adventure and you know it's going to take more than a session, you, you could just make sure that the player characters return to their camp. Because if it's going to take more than a session, you know, you could probably assume it's going to take more than a day in game time. So they're going to have to camp somewhere. They can't return to town at the end of the day. So have them make a camp and just make sure that the player characters get back to the camp. And, you know, if you're dealing with the large pool of players, which, again, if you don't have the pool of players, you don't need to worry about any of this. But if you do, then at least if one of those players can't make it next week, you, you can just say, well, you you just stay in camp for some reason. So at least they're all in in kind of their own little reset place out in the wilderness. You're, you're still going to have issues if a player wants to use one of those characters doing something else. You know, that's not going to be possible, but at least it, it eliminates some of the issues that might that might come up. All right. So thank you, Chris, for for your feedback and for your question. All right. Um, so let's see what's next. Oh, yes, of course. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive a copy of Limitless Adventures uh, supplement. Uh, this is for D&D called Limitless Non-Player Characters Volume 1. And I, I've uh, actually I've been sitting on this for a while. Uh, they, they sent this to me quite a while ago. Um, and I apologize to Limitless Adventures. It took me so long to get around to, to talking about this. Um, but I just wanted to, to real quickly um, tell you about this um, because I've looked over it. And, and I think it's a really uh, useful tool for GMs running D&D or any other uh, fantasy RPG. And this is really, it's just a bunch of NPCs. It is uh, 100 fully detailed NPCs for your campaign. And uh, these are really, really nice. I mean, they are um, grouped together for you. You've got allies, contacts, foes, merchants, uh, arch enemies. And the thing I really like about them, well, first of all, it's always great to have NPCs. Um, as, as a, as a GM, you are going to come up with so many NPCs. And even if you just count the ones that are the quote important NPCs, whether that's because you planned on this NPC being important or the NPC becomes important because the player characters really latch onto this one NPC, even just counting those important NPCs, you know, you, who knows how many NPCs you're going to come up with over the years running games. I mean, I mean, just tons of them all the time. And so it can, especially after a while, it can become more and more difficult to come up with NPCs that are unique and memorable and, and all that good stuff. So being able to have access to NPCs that are already created, even if you have to modify that NPC quite a bit to fit your campaign or adventure, it still saves you a lot of work and brain power and, and can give you inspiration for, for new types of NPCs you, you can make yourself in the future. So even if this were just a book with just 100 NPCs in it, that would be pretty cool. But another thing that, that this does that, that I really like is, for one thing, they give you treasure. <laughs> and this is something I wish that the, um, the monster manual did. Uh, you know, obviously we have treasure tables in the DMG and we, and we can use a monster CR to know which treasure tables to roll on, but it would be nice if for each monster in the monster manual, they gave us a sample treasure just in case maybe you just decide to use this monster on the fly for a random encounter or something and you didn't really prepare it and, and just to say, oh, well, this is what your average goblin carries in his pockets kind of thing so you don't have to take the time to, to go look at the DMG and come up with a tre with a treasure or whatever if it's just kind of a, a throwaway encounter that you just used on the fly um, so this does that um, so now now of course these are NPCs which is a little different than a monster in the monster manual um, but they um, 
they all, I think they all, all the ones I looked at have, have a treasure. So they tell you any money they're carrying, um, any, so, some of it's just interesting things that, that aren't even, might, might be considered like a trinket that, that aren't really magic items. They're not really treasure per se. It's just something interesting that, that the NPC has that could just be something interesting the player cur- player characters find, or it could be something that, that you use as a hook into some kind of adventure. Speaking about hooks for adventure, that's the other thing I really like about this supplement is um, in addition to giving you the treasure for the character, it also gives you uh, some adventure hooks. So some ways that you could use this character in an adventure or to spring load an adventure or an encounter. So these have, you know, all the all the stats that, that you need, all the game stats uh, has a little bit on how to role play the character um, and uh, just some some basic information of the character. And, and the other thing I really like about this, uh, which this may not be super obvious. Um, well, I guess there's two things. I keep seeing more things. Um, another thing I like is that they have uh, a description, which is something else that the Monster Manual lacks. Um, so each of these has a short one or two sentence description of what the thing looks like so that you can use that to just give to your players to describe what they see or use that um, to build your own description from. And the thing that I like about this, especially that isn't maybe obvious at first glance, is these are really short. So I'm I'm looking at one now. Let's see, who am I looking at? Bosmolic the Redeemed. Okay, this guy is a CR10 dragon. Um, and so this is a dragon, right? This is a pretty uh, complex character as far as characters go. Um, so the description is the dragon has deep red scales and black horns. Around the dragon's neck is a platinum holy symbol. So, you know, not only does that give you a, dis- a description, but that platinum holy symbol, like that's a hook right there. What is that? Right? It's not every day you see a, a dragon with a holy symbol around its neck. Whose holy symbol is it? What god is it for? Why does the dragon have this holy symbol? Like already this is leading to interesting questions. We've got all the, the stats. Um, and then we have a very short paragraph. Um, literally, it looks like two sentences. I'm just telling you about this dragon. Um, he's a lawful good young red dragon. Claims you encountered the god of metallic dragons. The dragon claims that during this religious experience, truths were revealed, questions were answered, and the true path was discovered. And um, yeah, so so I guess the holy symbol is for uh, what would that be? Um, oh, what's the the good dragon's god name? Uh, Bahamut. I think that's it. Um, it's amazing what you blank on when you're po- podcasting. Uh, and then and then the treasure is one line. The further adventure, the adventure hooks, you've got three uh, short phrase hooks. So this whole thing is on one page and and the majority of it is a stat block. And it's just, it's really well laid out and and it's really concise, which is a problem I've had with a lot of wizard stuff is they give you walls of text, which when you're running a game, it's hard to deal with walls of text. Like you're, you're either skimming it, scanning it, not reading it, or your players are bored to tears while you're sitting there reading it, right? Um, so for things that you're going to use at the table, concise is is the word of the day. And, and these are all very concise. Um, gives you some good flavor, gives you some good uh, things that you can jump from, some good ideas to get you started. Um, but is not just throwing a bunch of words at you. Is not like reading an essay. Um, so, so these are very easily used during play. So I will have a link to this in the show notes. Um, so this is, uh, what was it? It's by Limitless Adventures, and it is called uh, non, Limitless Non-Player Characters, Volume 1. So presumably there, there will be more volumes of these, uh, which is awesome. So, so check them out. I'll, I'll have a link in the show notes. And uh, again, I don't, <laughs> I don't get paid to do this. This isn't a paid advertisement. Um, I just uh, occasionally game publishers send me stuff to check out. And when I see something I especially like, I, I tell you about it. So um, I, I really like these NPCs and I'm 
probably going to use some of them, I'm sure, because I I often draw a blank when I'm trying to come up with, with NPCs. Now, recently on a previous episode, I kind of off the cuff mentioned uh, a topic that I wanted to talk about on the show in a future episode. I think it was maybe when I was talking to Brett um, about how maybe stepping on toes isn't so bad at all. And after all, and uh, listening to the episode later, I realized that I didn't really say what I was trying to say very well. And I, I kind of, um, I, I don't know. I just don't feel like I really communicated what, what I wanted to say. And I'm really surprised that I haven't gotten any emails or anything from someone like calling me on what I said, because what I said during that discussion wasn't really what I meant to say. And, and, um, yeah, wasn't really what I meant to say. So I'm surprised no one's like called me on it and been like, you know what you said, Lex didn't really totally make sense. So I'm going to really quickly hit this again. And this time I've got my notes so I can be sure to say what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So, so what I'm talking about here um, is this idea you'll hear discussed about um, avoiding having your player characters in an RPG group stepping on other characters' toes. Now, this could be a discussion uh, of character creation when you're building a party and it's like, oh, well, I don't want to make a character that steps on this other character's toes. And what we mean by that um, is we have one character who has something that's like their thing, their specialty. So we have a rogue who's really good at disarming traps and picking locks and stuff like that. So if we have this established character that's the rogue, that, that's, that, that's this character's wheelhouse, and then someone else makes a character that basically does the same thing, that's like, oh, you're stepping on, on their toes. Um, so that's one kind of context for this. Um, but what I'm really talking about here is more from the game design context. And I think that's part of where I went wrong last time is I was talking more about um, character creation and party makeup. And, and really what I, I meant to say is, is more about game design. So Dungeons and Dragons, for instance, when we design the game of Dungeons and Dragons, when we design the classes and the various abilities and things like that, should we worry about this idea of stepping on toes? And, and if we have a character class, say, like the rogue, whose thing is picking locks and disarming traps and moving silently and all this stuff, is it okay to have another character class that does some of those things? And you'll hear a lot of people say that that's not okay and that that's bad design because you don't, you want every player character to be unique and, and have you, you want each player's character to have something that they're good at that's like their thing. And, and that's like this ideal that you want. And you don't want other characters in the party stepping on their toes. And, and a way to avoid this is to have only one class that can do that thing, right? Um, so I've just kind of always accepted that, you know, as you tend to accept things that you hear a bunch of people say, you're just like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, however, I was listening to Jeremy Crawford, who's uh, the rules lead for D&D, uh, talking on one of the Sage Advice segments for their podcast. Um, and he said something that, that made a lot of sense to me and kind of made me rethink the, the way I, I look at this. He said that one of the goals that they had as designers with the system of fifth edition was to give players options and to give them more than one way to realize a particular character concept. So let's say you want to be the character that can pick locks. Well, obviously you could be a rogue and do that, but that's not the only way that you can do that. You could also do that with a background. There are backgrounds that will give you proficiency with these tools. You could do that with a feat. You, maybe you can take a feat that will give you proficiency from with thieves tools. So, so that was their kind of philosophy when, when they built the game was whatever niche a player might have or whatever concept they're trying to realize with a character, we want them to have more than one way to do that. We don't want them, you know, like I want to be able to pick locks. Well, you have to play a rogue. We don't want that. We want them to have options. 
So the idea, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the idea was that um, this is is seen as a good thing because you you have more options, you know. So so it's like, um, you know, maybe I want to be able to pick locks, but maybe for some reason I really don't want to be a rogue. Maybe I really want to be a fighter, or I really want to be a wizard, or or whatever. But I want to be able to pick locks. So you should be able to do that. You shouldn't be like forced to play a rogue just because you want to pick locks. Um, so this this whole idea, I think, of stepping on toes is very situational. And I think what really matters at the end of the day um, is... Um, sorry. Uh, what really matters at the end of the day is that every player in a given group feels like they have something to contribute. You know, that's really what's important. That's that's where you're going to have problems is if you if you have a player in your group who feels like they're not adding anything to the group, they don't have anything that they can do that they're good at. They don't have any way to contribute to what the group is is trying to do. So that's, you know, that's when you're really going to have problems. That's what really matters about that, about this. Um, and personally, I think that that has a lot more to do with party design and, and you know, which what characters are we as players going to build and play as part of this party than it does with the design of, of the game. So the party design is really that's up to the players and, and also the DM who kind of referees all this. Um, and I don't think it really needs to have anything to do with the game design or, or I don't think just just because the game allows there to be overlap doesn't mean that your party has to have overlap. Also doesn't mean that overlap is a bad thing. So you know, maybe no one in, in your group wants to play a rogue. So for that group, having other options to get those quote rogue abilities like picking locks is a good thing. And it isn't stepping on anyone's toes because someone taking that feet or that background isn't stepping on the rogue's toes because there is no rogue. <laughs> so that's basically what I was trying to say last time. And, um, yeah, I don't feel like I, I got that across very well. So, so that's what I was trying to say. And, uh, I will just, um, remind you again, since, since I'm talking about this, that I did make a post on my blog over at starwalkerstudios.com slash blog, where I have compiled all the sage advice segments from, uh, the podcast or links to them. Um, so that, uh, if you want to go here, Jeremy, talk about the rules um, cause he's not on every episode of the podcast. I have all the episodes that he's on linked and, and I tell you what they talk about that episode as far as the rules. If you want to check out those sage advice segments. So, so you can go check that out. So speaking of things I hear people say that, that I don't completely agree with <laughs> another thing that I have heard more than one person say is that they think that world building is a waste of time, or at least after a certain point, world building is a waste of time because the players don't care or won't care. So I think the the idea behind this is that the players aren't going to care about the details of your world or your setting that you've come up with for, for the RPG that you play, um, that they're just not going to care. So why spend any more time than you have to coming up with the bare minimum of what you need for the world uh, to run the game or, or whatever, because your, your players aren't going to care about any of that anyway. It's really all that world building is for you. The players aren't going to care. And, you know, this is something that a lot of people say. This is something that a lot of people believe. And it, it may be true. There may be players out there. There probably are players out there that just don't care. Um, but I think that a lot of times it's not so much that the players don't care. It's all about how the GM is delivering information about the world 
to the players. Now, if you truly have players who don't give a fig (laughs) about your world that you've created, if they literally do not care at all, um, maybe find better people to play with. Maybe find people that are worth the time that you put into your game to play with. It's just a thought. However, I think that a lot of times that's not the case. It may seem like it's the case, but I think a lot of times it's not so much that the players don't care. It's how you're giving them the, the information. So just like uh, when, when Brett was on, we talked a little bit about railroading and how I feel. And I, I think Brett agreed with me that a lot of times the issue of railroading, and by that, I mean, Um, I'm not talking about plotted adventures or linear adventures or anything like that. When I say railroading, I mean that bad thing that you can do as a GM where uh, there either are no choices players can make or the choices they can make are are illusory and they have to do what you, the GM, want them to do. Um, One of the key phrases of a railroading GM is you can't do that. So if you find yourself saying you can't do that a lot, you you might be railroading in in the bad sense. So Brett Brett and I were talking about that and and I believe that a lot of times the bad thing of railroading that happens, it's got nothing to do with you're doing a linear adventure or a published adventure or a dungeon or what. It's got nothing to do with the adventure itself. It it's not even necessarily um what you're trying to do as a GM, it's got a lot more to do with your technique and your finesse or more specifically your lack of finesse. And and we talked about how I think you could take the same adventure, take a linear plotted adventure, give it to two different GMs to run. And the one GM could run that adventure and it could be very railroaded. Players feel like they have no agency, feel like they have no choice, like they're just being dragged along by the GM. And a different GM could run the exact same adventure and it doesn't feel railroady at all. Players feel like they have agency, feel like they're making important choices, like they can do what they want. It's all about how the GM approaches that adventure. So I think that it's the same kind of thing with world building. You know, if, if it seems like the players don't care, maybe it's not the, a problem with your world. Maybe it's not a problem with the players Maybe it's not that the players actually don't care. It could be just how how you're trying to get information across. Um, And, you know, a lot of times on this show, I talk about writing because I've spent a lot of time uh, learning to write and and perfecting the craft of of writing. I shouldn't say perfecting because I'm nowhere near perfect. Um, Improving my my, uh, ability to to write. And I think that there's a lot of parallels between how you're a good writer and and how you're a good GM. There's now they're not exactly the same because obviously uh, a good adventure is not a novel (laughs) because in a novel I can control what all the characters do. Um, Obviously in in a good RPG, I'm not controlling what all the characters do. Uh, The players control their characters. But that said, there's a lot uh, of overlap between being a good writer and being a good GM um, because at the end of the day, both involve crafting stories and storytelling, which storytelling tends to be storytelling across mediums. Even uh, if you're talking movies or TV or plays or, or whatever, good storytelling tends to be good storytelling. So if you think about books that you've read or even TV shows you've seen or movies you've seen, we've all seen um, exposition, which is to say descriptions of the setting, history, uh, the, the current situation, what's going on, what characters are thinking, what characters believe, all, all the, the details, right? All the things that, that aren't just two characters having a conversation or something cool happening. Um, we've all seen Expedition done well, and we've all seen it done poorly. So if, if we're talking about a book, we've all read a book where there's pages and pages of description and nothing interesting happening, especially at the beginning of a book. If a book starts out that way, um, well, usually they don't get published, but you know, it's not a fun read, right? Um, and if we're talking about a movie or a TV show, you know, we've all seen the movie 
where you have to watch half an hour of the movie before anything interesting happens and you're bored to tears waiting for something interesting to happen. So that, that would be an example of expedition done poorly. Um, an example of it done well is um, from like a, a book standpoint, you'll notice, um, and, and this is kind of across the genre, so it doesn't matter if we're talking regular fiction, fantasy fiction, science fiction, you'll notice that a lot of good books um, just drop you in the middle of the, the action. So um, for instance, let's take the book Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. I, I just recommended that book to someone uh, earlier this week on the community. Um, so it's kind of in my head right now. And, and he does this really well. So when you start reading Mistborn, Chapter one is not 20 pages telling you everything about the world and the history and the different political factions and how the magic works, blah, 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 right? That's not how the books are. The book starts in the middle of the story and you're just thrown into it. And there's a lot happening that you don't completely understand because Brandon didn't sit there and write 50 pages of exposition first. So you're kind of like scrambling as a reader, trying to figure out what's going on. And over the course of the story, you learn all those things. You learn the history, you learn the political environment, you learn very detailed information about how the magic works, what the magic can do, what it can't do, how it does what it does. You learn all that through the course of that first book, but it's, it's how that information is conveyed to you. So the way it's conveyed to you is in little bits and dribbles here and there as it's relevant. So when someone uses the magic, you might be told a little bit about what they're doing and how they're doing it and why it works that way, but you're not told everything all at once. So in, in the same thing with movies, right? So we've, we've seen this, whether you read or not, if you watch TV, you watch movies, you've seen it done well, you've seen it done not so well. So as a GM, when you want to talk about your setting with the players, think about the, the good examples of your own movies or, or stories that you've particularly liked that you think did a really good job of getting information across without being boring and try to do that with your game mastering. So, you know, for instance, having pages of typed out stuff that you're going to read to the players at the beginning of the session or at any time really is probably not a great idea because just like in, in a book, if you have pages and pages of just, you know, like you're like, here's the history of the kingdom in 10 pages, that's pretty boring to read. Or, or if you're watching a, a movie where there's like really no, no drama, there's no, there, there's no conflict. There's nothing happening. It's just like telling you, how things are in, in this world, um, that's not terribly exciting either. So, in, you know, you can have those pages of information for your reference that you can refer to, but only give information when, when it's relevant. So when a player asks for more details, like they, they go into a temple and they want to know what's a temple look like. Well, that's a perfect time to tell them not only what the temple looks like, but you can describe some of the religious symbology they see. So, so for instance, I, I've been working on my agriculture goddess. So maybe they see um, sheaves of, of grain um, or they see uh, artistic depictions of the crops that are grown locally and things like that. So, so you can use your description to convey a, a few little bits of, of the religion. And, and that's something where, you know, each of those little bits that you throw out to the players is the tip of an iceberg, right? So, and a player can grab onto one of those if they want to. And the player could say, Oh, sheaves of grain. I, I want to explore this tapestry more. Tell me more about this tapestry. And then you, you give them more information. And that's the, the nice luxury we have as game masters that writers don't have, whether they're writing a novel or a, or a screenplay is we get to interact with our audience, our audience gets to ask us questions that we get to answer. So as a writer telling you a story, I have to anticipate all the questions you might have as a reader and be sure that I answer them uh, at some point in the story and preferably before you really need 
that answer. Um, but I really don't know, right? I don't really know what your questions are as a reader. All I can do is guess. But as a game master, our, our players can ask us questions. So I would say if, if I were to give just kind of a, a nugget of advice, I would say when it comes to descriptions, when it comes to setting up your your setting, I would try to kind of less is more. I would try to um, make my descriptions as concise as I could, like short and and to the point and and pack a lot of information in a few words. Uh, Focus on uh, Stephen King's advice. Pick three things. So whether you're describing a character, whether you're describing a place, whatever you're describing, a magic item, describe three things about it that are that are interesting or unique. So, um, you know, the, the example Stephen King gave was a diner, right? We all know what a diner looks like, so we don't need to tell you that there's a kitchen, that there's tables and booths where people sit at, that there's a cash register, blah, 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 a parking lot, right? Like, we all know what a diner is, so we all make certain assumptions of, of what's there. So if I want to describe this diner to you, All I need to do is describe three things that make this diner different, that that stand out. Like if you're someone walking into this diner for the first time, what are the first three things you're going to notice? Which are probably going to be three things that are not usual, right? That you don't see in every diner. Um, So maybe, I don't know, maybe there's, I, I think I said this last time I talked about this, there's all kinds of taxidermy on the walls, right? Creepy as hell, like all these dead animal heads hanging on the wall. You know, that's not something you see in every diner. So so that could really set that. Um, I've been watching a lot of Critical Role recently, and Matt Mercer seems to do this. Um, it's not always three things, but a lot of times it is. And something that I've noticed that he does, and, and this is something I want to do uh, myself, and, and Stephen King might have even uh, recommended this. This is from his book on writing, by the way, which it's been a while, so I don't remember if he recommended this or not. But something I noticed that Matt Mercer does is when he describes those three things, usually one of them is a smell and one of them is a sound because we're very visual and we tend to, when we describe things, we tend to focus on what you see. Um, and we tend to, like, you don't have to think, oh, I should tell them what it looks right, like, right? Like, you always know to tell them what the thing looks like, but you might forget to tell them any interesting sense that they smell you might forget to tell them any interesting sounds that they hear. So if every time you go to describe something, whether it's an NPC or a place, if you think I'm going to describe three things that are interesting or unusual about this thing, one will be a smell, one will be a sound, and then one will be something they see. Um, And maybe, you know, maybe a given NPC might have a perfume that the PCs notice and, and they smell that, or maybe an NPC might have really strong body odor because, you know, he was just working hard on the farm or whatever, or, or this NPC smells like cow shit because she was shoveling cow shit or whatever. So, so there might be times where, where you can come up with a smell. Sometimes you may not, but at least the, ex, the exercise of trying to come up with a smell will lead to you more often giving smells than you would otherwise. And a nice thing about smell, especially is it can really um, ground you in the place or the person and, and smell um, is very emotional. Um, It can trigger memories. It can trigger emotions. So it's a great way to, to give a little more emotional impact to what you're describing. If you remember to describe a smell, if there's one present that's unusual that the, the player's would notice. It's also a way, and, and sound too, are ways that you can foreshadow or hint at things. So if they're in a dungeon, they might smell a weird smell that's coming from somewhere else in the dungeon and could be a clue to what they might encounter later. Um, maybe they, they smell brimstone and they end up encountering a red dragon or something like that. Same thing with sound. They, they could hear sounds that are coming from deeper within the facility. They can't see what's there yet, but they can hear it. And it can give them some clue as to what might await them, or it can just build tension because they hear these weird sounds. They don't know what they are. So, um, so yeah, I, I think when, when you're describing your world, try to, you know, not give these really long in-depth descriptions where your players are, are visibly getting bored. 
Um, you know, I, I think a good place to start is think of three interesting things. If you can make one of those things a sound and or a smell, that's awesome. Um, so, you know, give short, concise descriptions. And with those things that you desc- that you do describe, whether it's three or five or how many you describe, try to make them like hooks. Try to make them something interesting to where the player might want to know more about that thing. You know, like, e- like I said, each of these are like a tip of an iceberg. So maybe I describe this weird symbol in the temple and the player's like, what's that about? And they ask about it. Now I can give them more information about that symbol and also at the same time give them more information about the religion, about the setting, you know, again, not, not droning on and on forever, but, um, you know, giving them interesting little tidbits that the players can grab onto, ask more about, and now that's a window into more information. And just the the other thing is, is like what, what writers do focus on what's important and what's necessary right now, you know, do your players really need to know a thousand years of history of your setting for the first session? Do they really need to know that to start the adventure? You know, most campaigns, probably not. Now, maybe for yours, they, they really do need to know. But, written, you know, ask yourself, do they really need to know? If they don't, then don't clog up your game session with this information they don't need. Wait until it becomes relevant and then give them the information. So... You know, another way that that we can give information to players other than just telling them at the table is giving them handouts. And um, again, I would recommend trying to keep these as short and concise as possible while while still making them engaging and interesting um, and try to limit it to what the players either need to know or what they've expressed interest in. Um, and, and just kind of give your descriptions and give your world building information, uh, sort of on demand when the players ask for it, give it to them, but don't give it to them when they don't ask for it. And especially don't give it to them when they don't want it. And kind of, uh, kind of a more advanced thing you can do to try to foster, uh, more interest in the setting and just to avoid the players checking out every time you describe something is give them hints in your descriptions that a player who's paying attention can use that hint to somehow uh, help the party out or help them achieve a goal. And don't, um, don't pull your punches when it comes to negative consequences that may happen to the characters because they weren't paying attention to information that you gave them. If you gave them the information, then they should be responsible for that information and if they forget it or they weren't paying attention and there is a negative consequence of that, then that thing should happen. And over time, it may inspire the players to start paying closer attention, maybe even taking notes when you describe things or tell them uh, what's what's going on. And um, this is kind of kind of an aside, but but something interesting about this, I, I've talked quite a bit with people lately about um, uh, theater of the mind and um, the challenges of theater of the mind and, and a uh, criticism. I don't know if that's the right word, but but something I hear people say a lot about theater of the mind is basically that the the players don't pay attention and, and they get confused because the G, when the GM is saying the scene or describing things, the players aren't paying attention and then they're confused because they don't know what's going on or they don't know where things are. And a lot of times the argument is, well, if I use a map and miniatures, then the players can look at that and get the information. But my thought to that is always like when the GM is talking, the players should be paying attention. And if they're not, that's something they need to learn to do <laughs> because that's going to cause all kinds of problems in the game and in the campaign. If the players aren't paying attention, um, whether or not you're doing theater of the mind, it just so happens that with theater of the mind, uh, those issues are going to happen more often and be more obvious uh, and come up probably more quickly than they would otherwise. But even if you're not doing theater of the mind, you're going to have issues if your players don't don't pay attention. And, and I almost feel like, you know, if I'm a GM and 
I'm trying to do theater of the mind and my players aren't paying attention and it's causing problems. And so then I decide to use the map instead. Aren't I just giving my players a crutch? Aren't I just enabling them to continue uh, being poor players instead of improving and becoming better players who actually listen and pay attention to the GM? Kind of seems like it to me, especially if that's my reason that that I'm doing it. So, um, yeah. So I think, you know, it, it's a two way street, right? Like, like everything in, in RPGs, it's a two way street, you know, and, and on the GM side of the table, um, we can really help this by giving descriptions when they're needed and not otherwise trying to make our description short and to the point and trying to refrain from just info dumping on the players and instead waiting until information becomes relevant to tell them because you know, a lot of it is stuff that their characters would know. Right. And that's what a lot of GMs will say. It's like, well, I gave my players 20 pages of stuff to read because this is stuff their characters would know. And you know, that's valid, but if it doesn't matter, who cares? Right. I mean, there's a lot of things I know as, as a person that aren't relevant right now today in this moment. So if we were playing a game right now and I was playing myself as a character, like I don't need to know my 40 years of history to be able to play this scene right now. I just need to know a few things maybe. So, you know, it can be tempting to give your players a, a ton of information because it's like, well, their characters would know this, but if it's not relevant, you know, don't, don't worry about it right now. You know, unless, like I said, if the players want more then of course, give them more. And I think that if you're kind of more miserly, with the information that you give out in the world, if you limit it to what their characters would actually know, and even that information you limit to what is actually relevant right now or what the players specifically ask you about, that you can create this, this almost sense of like information scarcity, right? Like always leave the players wanting more, right? Like never give them every bit of description that they want. Always leave them wanting more. Always leave them wondering. And, and in your descriptions, have little hooks, interesting things that are like, what's that about that? Hopefully the players will investigate to draw them into getting uh, more information. So, so yeah, make, make descriptions short and concise and to the point, uh, use them sparingly, try to only give what's relevant or what's requested. Try to leave the players wanting more. So to further build their interest in the setting, don't overload them with a bunch of information they don't want. So, so yeah, I think, I think that, um, if, if you think about that technique and, and you try to use that technique more, um, you will find that your players will care more about your setting. I think a lot of times GMs who feel like their players don't care, it's because they're just overloading them, you know, and they can't keep up and, and it's way beyond the point where they're actually interested in it. So, you know, leave them wanting more a little bit um, and, and keep it relevant, relevant and evocative things that are going to to interest them and, and be interesting. And, and then finally, you know, let there be consequences for missing things or forgetting things or not paying attention. Let those consequences happen. And, and I think all these things together, it, it's not really the goal here. Is it so much to I want my players to care about my world? I mean, that that's great. Um, but that's not really the goal. The goal is to have a better experience at the table for everybody. And if the players are checking out every time you describe something, it's not going to be fun for anybody. It's going to cause all kinds of problems. So it's better to train your players uh, to pay attention and at the same time, you know, be worth uh, paying attention to. So from the GM side, you know, make it interesting and, and relevant. And from the player side, you know, pay attention. <laughs> I guess it's, uh, it's really as sim simple as that. And, um, finally, uh, before we move on to, to other topics, uh, ironically, Brett is in the chat and, and he says that, that he does agree and, uh, he doesn't think railroading is a way to play so much as it's a technique in GMing. So, so yeah. Um, so, so Brett does agree with that, which, which is good to know. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think with this description thing and the world building thing, it, it's the same 
kind of thing. It's not that the description is bad. It's not that player, no players care about the GM's setting. It's all about our technique and how we go about doing things. This is Mike Shalai, and you're listening to Game Master's Journey. I want to take a minute to give a quick shout out to the patrons of Star Walker Studios. The support of the patrons makes this show possible. If you enjoy Game Master's Journey and you'd like to give a little back, becoming a patron is a great way to do so. It's because of the patrons that all listeners of Game Master's Journey enjoy a bonus episode every month, which is this episode right now that you're listening to, as well as the monthly Game Master's Journey live stream. So really two bonus episodes every month. I'd also like to give a huge shout out and thank you to my tier five patron, Steve. Let's hear it for Steve. Yeah. Yes. You the man. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you to all the patrons. You can find out more about becoming a patron by clicking on the Patreon button at the top of the show notes at starwalkerstudios.com. All right, coming back uh, to our micro topics today. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, and I will link to this in the show notes. The next thing I want to talk about is Jeremy Crawford's nine insider hacks for players in DMs. So this was on uh, Kotaku. And Jeremy Crawford, again, is the rules lead for Dungeons and Dragons. And this was this is pretty cool. I've I use many of these techniques myself, and uh, I thought I would share with you uh, his nine hacks for players and DMs. So number one, he says rejigger ability rolls to fit what your character is good at. A small and hidden rule in the player's handbook cracks open party rolls so players can stop getting pigeonholed. Hey, this is kind of relevant to what we were talking about earlier. Mix and matching ability scores and skills you're proficient in. Jeremy Crawford says a lot of people think, for instance, oh, whenever I use persuasion, it's always paired with charisma. But in fact, there's a variant rule that lets players pair, pair any skill they're proficient with with any ability score, depending on what's happening in the story. So Jeremy says, if somebody, for instance, is trying to persuade somebody, they can do it with a kind of acrobatics routine. I might say, all right, give me a dexterity persuasion check. Players, he said, can just add their proficiency bonus to whatever ability bonus is relevant to what they're trying to do. This opens up characters who might not typically be persuasive to taking the lead in those scenarios. Perhaps highly charismatic characters could talk their way through a successful sleight of hand, which would typically be a dexterity check, not charisma. So yeah, this is one I definitely use and and just very simply put, much simply, much more simply put than what the article said, is basically just pairing a skill with any ability that makes sense, not just the ability that's normally associated with that skill. So they're giving the example of persuasion. It's normally a charisma skill. But you as a, as a DM can decide to use it with other skills when you think it's appropriate. A classic example of this is intimidation, which is also usually a charisma skill. But there can be times where a player could do a strength intimidation role instead. So I think the impo- important point here is, first of all, if you're a DM running D&D, be aware that this is an optional role you can use. And there, there will be times where it will just occur to you oh, this should be strength intimidation instead of charisma and you, you'll call for that role. But also I think it, it's good for players if you're playing d d to remember this as well and ask your DM if you can use another ability score instead. Now, of course, you're probably going to be like, let's say 
you're a barbarian and you want to intimidate someone and you have an eight or a 10 charisma, obviously you're not going to do great with charisma, even if you're um, proficient in, in persuasion or intimidation, I mean. Uh, so, but maybe you have a really high strength, like an 18 or a 20 strength. So obviously you, you have much better chances of success on that role if you use strength instead of charisma. So, you know, as players, you're going to be looking to optimize your chances, right? You're going to be looking to, instead of use a stat you're not very good at, use a stat that you are good at. Um, as long as you can come up with a reasonable explanation for how you're doing that, using that other stat, I think a lot of GMs will probably let you do it. Now, probably not all the time, you know, um, but when it's appropriate, sure. All right, next is to keep combat moving along, hang initiative markers on your Dungeon Master screen. Uh, so this is, um, I, I think I'm going to paraphrase these because this article is really wordy uh, to say pretty simple things. Um, th this is basically just saying that you can take index cards, you can fold them in half so you can hang them on the top of your screen, and on the side that faces the players, you can write each character's name and then put them in initiative order across your screen. And then as each player goes, you move their card to the end of the line and you just keep rotating them along. Um, or alternatively, you could have some kind of marker that you hang over the card where the current turn is. That's how I would do it because always having to shift those cards around on your screen would be a pain. That way you just set them up at the beginning of combat and then maybe you have like a red ribbon that you hang over the person whose turn it is. And then on the side facing you, you could have their passive perception score. You could have the actual what they rolled for initiative or any other information about that character you want to have facing you. And you can reuse those cards, at least the ones for the player characters, every combat um, and just put them on there. So that's a pretty simple way to do it if you're if you're playing in person. Uh, get better technology is, is tip number three. And, uh, this one, uh, Jeremy talks about for Dungeons and Dragons. He uses a pencil, a notebook, player's handbook, monster manual, the adventure dice, blah, 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 blah. Um, so that's what he uses at the table, which is cool. That's how I run D and D. I'm very, I'm very analog. Even when I run online, um, I prefer using actual books and paper and dice than digital stuff. Um, but he says when he prepares for a campaign, he uses a word processor. Um, he also, uh, like me, uh, highly recommends Microsoft OneNote. Um, and you can get that on anything, any kind of phone, any kind of computer pretty much, um, and has cloud storage and syncing across devices and is a great way to, for DMs to organize, um, campaign information, world building information, all kinds of stuff. I even have one that a gentleman did. I have a one note notebook that has all the rules in it and it's really well done. So instead of, I never use it, but instead of going into the player's handbook or whatever, I could use that and probably more quickly find some things than, than I do in the actual book. Um, so, so yeah, you know, think about if there's ways that you can leverage technology, not so much at the table, but in your, your preparation, um, to, to help you prep. And, and I highly recommend OneNote. I love OneNote. Um, it's fantastic. You can organize, um, different notebooks. Uh, so, so for instance, I have here, let me open my, my notebook here. I have a notebook for Primordia. So I have numerous notebooks on OneNote and a notebook is this there's like different layers of organization. So for instance, I have my Primordia notebook. Within that notebook, I have various tabs. So some of my tabs are setting, races, magic items, spells, antagonists, encounters, deities, creatures, campaign, adventures, systems, back burner, and then my quick notes. So within those tabs, you can have, and you can have as many tabs as you want, and you can color code them. Within those tabs, you have pages and you can have as many pages in a tab as you want. So for instance, in my deities tab, I have my first page is gods of primordia in which I list all the gods and domains and all that good stuff. And then I have pages for each of the uh, deities individually. Within these pages, you can put pretty much anything in here. You can copy paste 
text into it. If you copy paste from somewhere online, like say a wiki or a forum or, or wherever, uh, when you paste it into OneNote, it also pastes in a hyperlink that will take you back to the source where you pasted it from. Um, you can drop images in there, just drag and drop images. You can resize them, whatever you want to do with the images. You can make tables. Uh, you can even put video and sound files in your notebooks and uh, you can easily move things around, format things. It's, it's super easy to use. And you can also create links, not only to places online, but you can create internal links. So you could link to another page or section in, in your notebook and uh, hyperlink things all over the place. And it's awesome. And the other uh, awesome thing about it, other than just as a way to organize everything, is, is you can um, access that anywhere. So I have actually two computers at home. I, I have a big desktop computer in the studio. And then I also have a laptop computer. I have one note on both of those computers. So I could use either of those computer. I, I can add things, change things, whatever. And, and they stay in sync. I also have one note on my smartphone. And so if I'm in a game session or I'm out and about in the world and I want to call up my notebook, I can, I can look up anything. I can add stuff on my phone. Um, it's, it's awesome. Highly recommend it. And, uh, yeah, as far as me personally, uh, like Jeremy, I, I use word, um, and, uh, I do a lot of stuff with, with word. I'd, I'd say word and one note are, are the things I use the most. And then occasionally I use Excel just for tables because Excel is a lot easier to make tables in, uh, especially when you want to move stuff around a lot and, and do any kind of like math operations or anything like that. All right. Next tip is weed out problem players before they can become a problem. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So he says, this isn't exactly a rule, but definitely a helpful guideline. Sometimes you're stuck with players who aren't fun to play with. D and D is supposed to be fun. That means you've got a problem. And the solution to the problem is to impose a sort of trial period on unknown quant quantities. Often the best way, of course, is to weed them out before they come. Whenever you are considering starting a campaign and you're thinking about including people you don't know, it's best to run a short one shot first and get a feel for these people and then decide who you want to invite to the campaign. So absolutely, if you're dealing with people you've never played with before, don't you know, don't bring them on for your, your epic magnum opus campaign, never having played with these people before. You know, what if they're a total douchebag? What if they don't get along with the other players? What if they want to play characters that are inappropriate or offensive or, or whatever, you know, um, run a, a short one shot and trial run, you know, try them out. See, see, see how you like them or, or even longer than the one shot. Like me personally, it might take more than one session to decide. Um, so I might run like a, a two or three session like adventure to kind of vet someone if I want to bring them into the campaign. Next, when in doubt, dodge it out. Um, this is uh, something Jeremy's mentioned on Sage Advice uh, at least once. Uh, really great advice. I always try to remind my players of this. And it's basically if you find yourself on your turn not sure what to do, take the dodge action. You can spend your action dodging, and that means that all attack rolls against you are at disadvantage. And it's a great thing to do if you're not sure what to do. Or, for instance, maybe you're in a tense situation and combat hasn't exactly started yet, but it could. And you don't want to instigate things. You don't want to fan the flames, but you also don't want to be caught with your pants down. You can take the dodge action, which is non-threatening. You know, it's not going to no one's going to start fighting because you dodged. But if the shit does hit the fan, then you're you're dodging. Uh, next tip, stop rolling monsters initiatives. So this is, this is pretty sweet little tip that actually, I don't think I've ever used this tip. I'm not even sure if this occurred to me until I read this, but it's kind of one of those things. Once you hear it, you're like, oh, duh. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a great way to speed up play during combat. Um, so you can basically, um, use a monster's quote, passive initiative score instead of 
rolling for initiative for the monsters. And it just works the same as every other passive score. You take 10 and add their initiative bonus, which is usually nine times out of 10, just going to be their dex bonus. So take their dex bonus, add it to 10. That's their initiative. And you can do it just like that. You don't have to roll. You don't have to waste time. And this works really great with large combats when you have a lot of monsters. You don't have to take time rolling all those initiatives. Um, yeah, that's basically that. Next, backgrounds are for spice, not hard and fast rules. When making a character, it's tempting to go by the book in all aspects, including guidelines for that character's backstory. With 5th edition's introduction of backgrounds, specific backstories that add proficiencies and grant items, I've noticed a lot of players cramming their story ideas into some pretty restrictive stereotypes so that they, quote, qualify for those bonuses. How about simply not doing that? Jeremy says, right at the beginning of the background section, we have a rule there that basically tells you that you can actually ignore all the backgrounds. If you want, give yourself whatever two skill proficiencies you want and whatever other elements it says you can give yourself so you can create the set of characteristics that makes the most sense for your character. Backgrounds are really just meant to give some spice to your character. So that's definitely a way you can approach that. If your DM's cool with it, you just say, hey, I want these two skills and, and these other things and kind of just on the fly put together your own background. Now, me personally as a DM, I wouldn't allow that. Um, that. There's just way too much potential for abuse there. And even the most well-meaning player is probably going to min-max when they pick those skills and everything else. And, um, you know, I, I guess I guess if I had a player that, that really had a concept and and they were being true to that, that, that might be okay. But I would still would be like, let's just make a background. They're, they're not hard to make. Um, you can make a background in like a few minutes, like five minutes or less. Um, so if you have this cool concept that can be boiled down to a single word and isn't already a background in the game, let's make it a background. And then everybody in the future can, can have access to this background. Let's hammer it out real quick. That's, that's what I would do. So, so I guess my version of this advice would be don't feel limited by the backgrounds given, feel free to create your own. And you know, something uh, I created, I think four or five backgrounds for my Primordia campaign I'm, I'm about to start. And something I did um, just kind of, just kind of came about is when I created the backgrounds, I created all the mechanical stuff. Like here's the skills you get, the proficiencies, all that stuff. Here's your starting equipment. Here's your special thing you can do with the background. And I didn't do the personality traits just because that's the part of creating a background that takes the most time and the most thought power, at least for me. And so I was just like, Oh, I'll do that later. You know, right now I just want to get the gist of what the backgrounds are. And then as time went, went on and I kept putting off doing those, I finally decided just not to do them because oftentimes what happens anyway is, is a player makes up their own personality traits anyway. You know? So if I had a player who was like, I want to like, for instance, one of my backgrounds is farmer. Okay. I really want to be a farmer, but I noticed you don't have any O spawns or flaws here. And I'm really stumped as, as to what mine would be. Then I would start rattling off ideas and I'd probably write them down. So I could add those to the background layer later. And I would definitely help the player uh, figure something out. But my experience has been a lot of times players will make up their own ones anyway. So why spend a bunch of my time coming up with all these O's, bonds and flaws that players aren't going to use anyway. If they need some inspiration, I can do that on the fly uh, with the player as needed. And then, and then of course, record that and add that. So, so I'm not uh, duplicating effort uh, that I don't need to. All right. Next is watch out for players who want to be evil. The bottom line when it comes to adding evil players to the party, I think he means evil characters is maybe don't. If a player is dead set on it and the dungeon master believes they can role play responsibly and not derail the game, Crawford recommends reminding players that, quote, even bad guides need to have friends or at least allies they can exploit. I caution people who play evil characters against screwing over their friends too much. He also noted that it's good for the dungeon master to ensure there's a common purpose among the group 
or at least relatively adjacent individual goals. And yeah, I think honestly, I think he got it right the first time when he said, just don't, don't allow it. <laughs> That's the easiest uh, way to avoid problems is don't allow uh, evil characters. It's just that simple. I, I think the only personally, this is my personal opinion. I think the only place for an evil character as a player character in a group is if the entire group is evil and you're running an evil campaign and that's what everybody sat down to do. If that is not the case, I don't think there's any place for him in the group. And, you know, you can argue that you can make it work with a good role player, blah, 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 blah. And yeah, absolutely. But those are exceptions, right? Those aren't the rule. I'd say as a rule, there's really no place for it. Um, if you have a notable exception, then you'll know, and it'll probably be part of the design of the campaign or adventure from, from the beginning. Right. Or, or, or a player comes with you to you with a pitch. That's just too good, uh, not to use. Um, and, and again, you know, this player really well, you know, they can handle it and, and blah, 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 blah. Because, you know, un- unfortunately for whatever reason, a lot of players who play evil characters like to mess with, the other player characters. They, they don't just direct their evil, selfish ways at NPCs. They also um, want to PVP with other players or steal from them or, or whatever. And um, even in the most well-meaning and mature groups that that can and often does lead to problems. And, you know, why do it? Unless it's really going to add something phenomenal to your story and your game, why do it? And the final tip is avoid DM burnout. When I'm DMing, I often spend just as long preparing for a game as my players do playing it. And yeah, that's definitely led to burnout. Crawford has a rule for this. He says preparation for any individual session should take no longer than half that session's length. So that's Jeremy's personal rule. So he says when, you know, if he's preparing for a four hour session, his goal is to spend no more than two hours preparing for it. Now, personally, I don't think that actual, the figure is what's important here. I think the, what's important is setting a limit, right? Whatever that limit is, just saying, I am only going to allow myself to prepare X amount for this session. I think that's a good idea because, you know, first of all, there comes a point where when you're preparing that you're kind of spinning your wheels, you're, you're either preparing things that you're not going to use. Um, well, a lot of it's preparing things you're not going to use. Like you're preparing for encounters. They're not going to get to that day or, um, you're preparing for NPCs. They might not even talk to or whatever. Um, or you're just getting too deep into the details of things. And, and, you know, I, I always, when I'm prepping, I always think about what I feel comfortable improving during play so for instance, if I'm, if I'm preparing an NPC, there are certain things I'm going to write down and think about ahead of time for that NPC. But then there are other things that I'm comfortable imp- improvising during play. So I'm not going to spend prep time worrying about that. So for instance, the way I role play an NPC and I can't do voices and accents. So in a way that's, that's actually a boon to me in that I don't need to spend a lot of time worrying about what kind of voice or accent I'm going to give to this character because I can't anyway. And, and so usually, or a lot of times my personal guidelines for an NPC will be a character from a movie or a TV show or, or maybe an actor, right? Like this character is like, um, I don't know. This character is like, uh, What's her face? This character is basically Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, for instance. Or um, this character is like this, but I'm imagining that he's played by Liam Neeson or, or something like that. And for me, with my limited acting and voice ability, that's enough for me that when I go to play that character at the table, I have some idea of where to go with it. And I really don't need more than that because I couldn't do anything with it anyway. Now, now, if I was a voice actor, it'd be a little more involved because I, you know, I'd be doing a specific voice and accent and all that stuff. Um, but, but my point is, is I don't sit there and write down all these notes about how to role play them. I just have a quick kind of shorthand, which for me is imagining a certain character 
from a story or a certain actor playing a certain character. And, and that's enough to get me going. And I feel comfortable improvising the rest of that character's personality on the, on the fly. So beyond thinking of, of what that touchstone is for that character, I don't need to spend time preparing that aspect of, of the character. So I think setting a limit is, is a good, good advice because you, you can kind of, cause until you do that, you probably don't even know how much time you're really preparing. I, I know I didn't, you know, you, you're probably spending a lot more time preparing than you realize. And if you have a limit, whatever that limit is, it's going to force you to manage your time more effectively and to think about what should, you know, I have two hours to prepare for this game. What should I really prepare? What's really important? Um, what am I going to be really uncomfortable um, what, like, like, what are the things that if I don't prepare them, I'm going to be really uncomfortable at the table versus things that are just kind of like gravy, save the gravy for the end. If you've got time, then you, you can do that. Cause I've, I've noticed in, in my past, before I started taking this advice, I tended to actually focus on the gravy because I tended to focus on things that just came to me. And a lot of times the stuff I needed was the stuff that was a little more difficult to come up with and took more thought. And I tended to put that off. And then, so if I run out of time, all of a sudden, the stuff that didn't get done is really the stuff I should have done first that was most important. So just by setting a time limit, it kind of gets you in that headspace of, okay, let's focus on what's important first. So that time limit could be like, like Jeremy Crawford's where you say, whatever my game session is, it's half that amount of time, um, or maybe equal to that amount of time or whatever is the right limit for you. So I will have a link to this in the, in the show notes, but I thought, uh, I thought that was some, some good advice. And a lot of these things I, I either do or I need to start doing. All right. So this last topic, this, this will be our last topic today. And this, I really want to do today because <laughs> this is going way back in the way back machine. Um, I want to talk a little bit about legendary magic items and, and just powerful magic items in general. Um, this idea came from a discussion we were having quite a while ago, back in January, <laughs> on the Game Master's Journey community. That's how long this has been sitting in my notes waiting to be uh, talked about. And we were actually discussing an Unearthed Arcana article that was about uh, Wizards was played... Um, playtesting a new uh, class, the Artificer. And one of the abilities that that class got was the ability to attune to more than three magic items. And uh, in the discussion of, of that article, uh, listener GMs Manny and Scott started talking about this, this concept, which this is a totally new idea to me, but, but I guess this is something that, that they've seen in their games where what if one of the player characters has all the really cool magic items? So the concern was, or, or the concern that was raised was, okay, let's say instead of being able to attune to three items, you're able to attune to five items. Let's say you have five player characters and you give each of those characters a super powerful legendary item that requires attunement. This character, this artificer that can attune to five items could take all five of those legendary items, attune to them and use them. And, and that character would be way overpowered, not just overpowered um, compared to the game and, and what the game is expecting a player character to be able to do. But I think more importantly, even overpowered compared with the other player characters. So, um, you know, really the, the, what they were talking about or we were talking about was really about this class and, and how, you know, maybe being able to attune to more than three items is, is overbalanced. But what I thought was interesting was this whole concept of one of the player characters having all the really cool magic items to create like this super powerful character um, and, and basically hogging all the powerful magic items, which to me is a, a problem that has nothing to do with how many items you can attune to. So I thought I would, I would talk about that a little bit. So first of all, I will say, <laughs> just to say it, that 
um, probably allowing just one class in the game to attune more items than everybody else. That's probably overpowered. Um, it, definitely overpowered as far as comparing them to other player characters. So if every character in the game can only attune to three items and you've got this one class that can attune to five, that's probably going to be overpowered. It probably needs to be addressed. Um, now adding more attunement slots overall to everybody, um, is going to lead to overpowering compared to what the game's assumptions are. But as long as you're doing it equally, at least the player characters theoretically will, will still be relatively equal in power. Um, I have to say though, you know, getting to this idea of, well, what if all one of the player characters has all the cool items and all my, my days, uh, going it's over 26 years now playing and running RPGs. I've never, ever seen this happen. I've never seen one player character wielding all the cool, powerful items that the group has access to. And in fact, I wonder how this, this even could happen because I, I've never seen it happen. And it seems like it'd be a really weird set of circumstances that, that would lead to this even happening. Um, but I mean, it is something that could possibly happen. And so I thought, you know, we'd think a little bit about, well, well, as a GM, how would you handle this? Like, how do we handle this if, if this actually happened? So first, I mean, we have to think about and wonder how could this even come about? Um, even if you as a GM allowed it to happen, why would all the players agree to that? Assuming they did, why, why would the other player characters agree to let my character have all the cool, powerful items so I can be ridiculously powerful and they can be my chump sidekicks. Like, why would they agree to that? Um, most players I've played with, probably all, honestly, but to be safe, I'll say most players I've played with tend to get pretty attached to their magic items. Um, so, so just a, you know, you know, uh, let's say Brett's in the chat. Let's say Brett is playing a paladin and he's got a Holy Avenger. And I'm like, Hey Brett, I want to use your Holy Avenger. Let me attune to it, which means Brett's no longer attuned to it. Brett would probably be like, screw you, Lex. This is my Holy Avenger. Go get your own. Right? So, so first, you know, you, I have to wonder how that could even happen because most players, you know, unless they've quote outgrown the item, they're not going to want to give it up. And if they've outgrown it, then it's not an item that the, this power character is going to want anyway. Um, so most players get pretty attached to their items and, and wouldn't willingly give them up to another player. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking like, how could this happen? So one thought is, well, maybe it's a situation where this player is hogging the item. So maybe he's finding the items first. Maybe he's the rogue that's like looking for traps. So he's the first one that opens the treasure chest and he's like using sleight of hand to like grab that magic ring and pocket it before anybody else sees it. Um, which is, which is basically in my mind, that's, that's PVP player versus player, um, behavior, which a lot of GMs will just say, you can't do that. They don't allow it because they don't want the drama that that leads to. Um, other GMs will allow it. Um, or it could depend on a given group or, or whatever. So, so first there's the question of as a GM, do you even allow that? Because you know, you're the GM, you have the right to say, sorry, you can't do that because we've all agreed that we don't PVP in this campaign or whatever your reasoning is. Um, so, so that was one idea I had it is, so maybe one of the players is hogging the items. They're somehow getting access to them before the other players, um, do, and, and they're, they're keeping them all for themselves. Um, so if that's what's happening, then I think that's more of an out of game problem with the players. It's not an in game in story problem with the characters because sure the player can make the excuse of, Oh, well this is what my player, my character would do, but we all know that's bullshit. Your, your character would do whatever you want it to do. It's your character. None of us are just computer programs following a set of parameters. We, we make exceptions to things every day, all the time, whether that's making an exception to what you would normally do or making an exception to what you think is morally right or wrong or making an exception to how many scoops of ice cream you'll eat or whatever. We make exceptions to things all the time. 
So this whole idea of I have to do this antisocial thing because that's what my character would do is, is total bullshit. So let's just call it for what it is. Okay. So even if they're making that excuse, it's an excuse and it's really about, well, why are you as a player who's playing with these other players who presumably are, if not your friends, at least people that you want to game and have a good time with, why are you putting your good time above theirs? Why is your happiness more important than theirs? You know, why are you choosing to do this thing that's going to upset other players just to make yourself happy? Why are you being selfish? Why are you being antisocial? You know, that's what we, that's the real problem, right? It's got nothing to do with the game. So, you know, that should be handled accordingly out of character, how, however you choose to do that as a GM. So the, I don't know the trying to think of, of how this could come to be, you know, I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's something where it's something the group decides to do. So it's not a thing of one player character being uncool and like trying to take everything. Maybe it's a thing of they're, they're going to fight the big bad boss and they're worried about their success and they come up with a strategy that involves one of them having all these uber powerful magic items while the rest of them do something else or, or whatever. And, and as a group, they decide that this is our best way to approach this problem is to give all these items to the one character. Um, and, and maybe it even is optimal. Maybe they, they figure out some way and you're like, oh, wow, if one character has all these things, they, they could just face roll this encounter or whatever. So how would we handle that as a GM? Well, first, the first thing I feel like I have to say here is if it's not an issue, don't worry about it. If it's not a problem, don't make it a problem. If it's not um, upsetting the players, you know, if it's a group thing and, and something they all agree to and everybody's on board with it, um, maybe it's not a problem. You know, if all the players are not on board, and one of the other players is maybe bullying them to let them do this thing they want to do, then that's a problem. But again, that's an out of game problem with the players. It's not an in game problem with the characters. So maybe you need to take that player aside and say, look, you know, I know everybody seems to be agreeing with your scheme here, but I can tell that not everybody's happy with this and, and you're kind of manipulating them or you're kind of bullying them or forcing them into it. And, you know, I'm just not going to let this fly because we're all here to have a good time. We're not just here for you to have a good time. Um, so handle that out of character. Um, but, you know, maybe it's not a, a problem with the players. Maybe the players are okay, okay with it. But it could lead to a problem in the sense of this one character becoming too powerful. So, you know, maybe if it's just for a single encounter, it's not a big deal, but, but it could be more of a big deal if it's something that they're going to do more long term. So this could be a problem because the other players end up feeling like they have nothing to contribute, like they're just sidekicks for this one player character. It could also be a problem for you as the game master and, and ultimately for everyone if this one too powerful PC is throwing wrenches and all your encounters and your adventures and everything you've prepared be, because again, they're, they're way beyond what the game or what you are assuming they'd be capable of. And this can be a, cause you might be like, well, why is that a problem? Who cares? Well, the, the reason that could be a problem is now there's no challenge. If it's too easy, if, if you're basically just handing things to the players because this one character is so powerful, nothing can, can challenge them. The game's going to lose its luster really fast. We enjoy challenge. You know, it's like, like, have you ever played a video game on like God mode? Right. It, it can be fun for a while, but it gets boring pretty quick because there's no challenge. There's no risk. There's no chance of failure. And it becomes ultimately pointless and, and meaningless. So the players in, in the same way in an RPG, they or all the players or this one player may enjoy it for a while and be like, oh, this is so awesome. I'm so powerful and, and feel like, oh, I'm so smart because I found this loophole and, and now I'm beating the game, right? Or I'm beating the dungeon master. But that's going to wear off after a while. And then what? <laughs> 
what happens when when that newness and that fun factor of oh i beat the game wears off and now it's like wow nothing's a challenge anymore so other than you as a gm just flat out saying no you can't do that which you can do and this is different this isn't you know i said before if you find yourself saying no you can't do that you might be railroading you know this is different you know that was um you know that's talking more about the player like i want to go here or i want to do this or i want to talk to that npc and you're like no you can't do that right that's railroading this is talking about one player doing something that's maybe antisocial or maybe just kind of ruining the fun for everyone else that's the time when it's okay to say you can't do that and again it's 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 your motivation, right? And it's how you do it. You know, it's like, I'm not saying you can't do that because you're going off script and I don't want to improvise. I'm saying you can't do that because you're being an asshole. (laughs) There's a huge difference there. All right. So, so you can just say no. So let's just take that as a given. You could just say no and just nip it in the bud. Um, But if you don't want to do that, there are other ways you could handle this if it becomes a problem Um, and you know, I, I feel like if the players are going to do this and you're going to allow it, it's going to be a problem. Even if you only have three attunement slots, you know, if, if you've handed out a few legendary items to the party and one character takes the three most powerful ones for themselves, um, it's probably going to create some problems. Now, again, if it's just for a single encounter, I mean, okay. So the, the boss fight was a face roll. Who cares? So what? Right. Um, so, you know, it might be a quote problem, but it's not worth dealing with. It's like, well, the next encounter will be more in challenging. Um, but if this is something where this player wants to do this over the long term, then, then that could be a problem. So how, how can we maybe address this? So my first thought is number one, as a DM, don't hand out legendaries as quote random drops, right? Like, <laughs> I personally try to avoid this as much as I can anyway. You know, I don't, I like random treasure hoards in the sense of it's fun to roll up a random treasure and see what you get. And it's appropriate sometimes. Like for instance, if you fight a dragon and you slay a dragon and it's got this massive treasure hoard, it's like, who knows what could be in there, right? And in that kind of situation, it kind of makes sense that you might find something quote random that you would have never expected to find. But when it comes out to handing out legendary items, and this is something that for me is much more true in fifth edition. than It has been in the past because of the three attunement rule. It's like you can only be attuned to three items. So there are lots of items in the game that don't require attunement, but those items tend to be either less powerful, which is to say not legendary or they're very specific situational items or they're items that you don't use in combat. So when it comes to powerful legendary magic items that you can use in combat that are really useful to your character, most of them are going to be requiring attunement, which means you can only have three of them. So if your character can only have three really powerful magic items, personally, I want those to be special. I want them to be items that I quote gave you. And by, by that, I mean items that I sat down and either created this item for your character, or I went through the items in the DMG and I said, Oh, this, this item would be perfect for Brett's character, right? Like this item fits his concept. It fits his character. I like, I can picture his, his character with this item. And that's the legendary he's going to get. Not just some random thing I rolled that maybe doesn't even make sense for his character or just isn't as cool as the one I handpicked or made up myself. Um, And so, so part of it is just, you know, you only get three of those. So I want them to be good. (laughs) I want them to be items that fit your concept and fit your character and actually going to be useful to you. Um, So that's one side of it. The other side is, I don't want to strain verisimilitude too much by having you find this super powerful item that fits your character perfectly as just a quote, random drop. To me, it makes more sense for you to get that as the reward of a quest or an NPC bequeaths it to you, or you create it yourself 
or something like that, right? Not just something you find under a rock somewhere, but something where there's some, you know, I don't know, maybe your, your God gives you visions that leads you to the item or something like that, which again, even if you're doing this as a random drop, so to speak, you could still make it not seem random by foreshadowing it. So let's say, you know, you're going to put a Holy Avenger for the Paladin in the Dragon's Treasure Hoard, and you know it's there ahead of time. You can foreshadow that, for instance, by maybe the Paladin has a dream where his God gives him a sword or an agent, an angel of his God gives him a sword. Or maybe the Paladin's dream is what leads them to find the Dragon in the first place. So that way, when the player finds that Holy Avenger, it's not like, oh, this is so random that this perfect item for me showed up in this treasure hoard, you know, Lex finally threw me a bone basically. Instead, it seems like, no, now I know why my God sent me to fight this dragon because my God wanted me to liberate this holy sword from the clutches of this evil dragon. So, so just using a little foreshadowing, you can even make a a random drop seem not random. So, so, you know, either foreshadow it if it's going to be in in a treasure hoard or have a powerful NPC gift the item to the PC, like an angel or other servant of the character's deity. If they're a pious kind of character or a superior in their organization, if they're in an organization or a rich noble NPC that they rescued, something like that. And the nice thing about this is not only does it not make, a legendary item seem random or just like a throwaway thing. It also allows you to give it to the character you want to have it. Cause that's another thing I've learned time again, as a, as a DM is I might make a quote, random treasure like a dragon's hoard thinking, okay, there's a ring of protection for the bard and there's a wand of magic missiles for the wizard. And there's a, a suit of elven chain mail for the ranger, Right. And, and I come up with these items for specific characters, but because they're just things laying in a pile of treasure, I don't have any control over who takes what. And maybe completely different characters end up with the items than what I planned. And this has happened to me more times than I can count, which is one of the reasons I started doing it this other way. So if an NPC gives them the item, then that NPC hands that item to that specific character. Now, of course, you can't really stop the player characters from trading later, but you can help dissuade them by saying things like, well, you know, the the queen gave you this sword and you'd feel it's disrespectful to just trade it with the other character for this other thing. Or, you know, you can figure out ways to kind of let the characters know indirectly that, hey, this is really for you. It's not for this other person. Um, Another way you could do that, just... Um, it just occurred to me is say that only that character can attune to it. I mean, we're talking about powerful items that require attunement. There's no reason that the sword that the queen gave the fighter can only be attuned by that character. You know, you, you got to wonder w- when you're creating a magical weapon or any kind of weapon, you, got, you always worry about it being used against you, right? And an item that requires attunement, what a great way to avoid it being used against you. Like for instance, the moon blades, can only be attuned by elves who are good. So the elves, when they created the moon blades, they were like, we don't want these falling into the hands of non-elves. We don't want them used against us. So non-elves, first of all, can't use them. They can't attune to them. And also evil or neutral, non-good characters can attune to them. So so we kind of hedge our bets a little bit there. So so yeah, you can have a, a specific NPC hand the item to the character that way. Or um, you could have the item more kind of assigned to a specific PC because that PC has visions or dreams about that item before they find it. And then that way, hopefully, the player is is invested enough in that item that when they find it, they're going to argue strongly, like, my character should have this because I've been dreaming about this cloak for weeks now. And, and now I know this is the cloak I was dreaming about, so I, I should have it. And again, unless you have antisocial players at your table, that should be enough to to get it in the hands of the person you want to have it. So second way to to handle this is make the legendary item sentient. So sentient items usually have their own ideas about who should or shouldn't wield them. 
they also tend to be jealous of other powerful items, especially other sentient items. So this not only will help get the item to the character you want to have it, but it also um, encourages them to spread items out because, you know, that item is not going to be happy with that character having too many powerful other other powerful items. Um, third idea here is uh, do your best to split the party as much as possible. I think this is just in general a good GMing rule. You should always split the party whenever you can, as much as you can. Um, why? Well, for our discussion right now, so that they can't rely on the resources of the entire group always being there for everything that they encounter. A few close calls or even character deaths should teach them the wisdom of not putting all their eggs in one basket. So you give all your powerful items to one character. Well, what happens to the other characters if they have an encounter in that character with all the powerful items isn't there? Now they're boned, right? That happens a few times that they'll learn the error of their ways and they'll be like, hey guys, we need to spread the power out. <laughs> so we're not completely helpless if John's character isn't here for some reason. So, yeah. So those are just uh, um, a few ideas. And and then finally, my, my last thought here is if for some reason you do allow one of the player characters to accumulate and wield all the powerful items in the group, a powerful non-player character could attack that player character when he's alone to try to steal that powerful magic. I mean, I mean this is something I think is really underutilized by, by us DMs. You know, we, we have these player characters who get fairly powerful and accumulate all these magic items. Seems like they'd be the target of thieves and, and, you know, people whose motivation for attacking the player characters is to kill them and take their stuff. Just like what the player characters do every session. You think that would happen a lot more. Um, so you know, have, have that, that one player character attacked when he's all by himself and the others can't help him by someone capable of overpowering him and, and taking one or more of these, these items away. Again, it's that whole, you know, don't put your eggs in one basket kind of thing. So I think as a, as a game master, I don't think it should be that hard to just put your foot down and just say that some behavior is not allowed at the table. You know, whether it's calling other players names or arguing about real world politics or religions or one player character taking all the magic items or PVP or whatever. If there's certain behaviors you don't want to see, there's nothing wrong with just saying, hey, th this kind of thing isn't allowed. Now, it's better to do it first. You know, it's better to, to make players know of things like that ahead of time than wait until it comes up and then be like, you can't do that. But do what you got to do. Um, but if for some reason you're not comfortable doing that or, or it's not uh, a good solution for your particular problem, um, there are still a lot of in-world, in-story ways that you can prevent this behavior or um, punish it, basically, when you see it happen. Make it seem uh, less appealing. I, I don't think it's something that we should really worry about as far as designing the game or designing adventures like for us as GMs, when, when you're making your adventure, I don't think you have to worry about, well, what happens if one player character gets all this stuff? Because I think just the nature of players, it's going to be rare that that happens because most players, they want their character to be cool. Right. And, and given all our cool stuff to one character, well, now one of us is really cool, but the rest of us are lame. And, and so, you know, obviously one of the players might be on board with that, but the rest of them, not so much. So, you know, it might be something you see them pull out once in a while as a strategy, but I don't think it's going to be often that you see this as like a, a consistent problem. Um, but, but if it is, I think, you know, there, there's ways that you can, um, make it less appealing that, that we've talked about and, you know, I think un unless you encounter it, it's not something you need to lay awake lay awake at night worrying about, Oh, what am I going to do if this happens? Um, and, and just remember, I, I see so many comments from people and hear so many comments from people, especially on YouTube 
who um, seem to think that the GM is no more than the AI of a video game. Uh, you see this a lot. Like I see this a lot running published adventures where I'll get comments like, oh, you know, you, you use the wrong monster for this, or you didn't use this secret door, or you didn't use this trap, or you, you did thing X that's different than what the adventure says, basically, is what all these comments boil down to. Like, these people think that I'm a robot carrying out a program, and the adventure is my program, and I cannot deviate from it. I, I, it makes me, I don't know, sad, I guess, a little bit, because it, it seems like that's where these people are coming from. And it makes me sad because it's like, you're missing the what's awesome about these games. That's what's awesome about these games is it's not a computer. It's not a pre-written program. It's a living, breathing person running the game who can make decisions on the fly, who can be creative, who can kind of adjust what they're doing to, to create the best story and, and the most fun session for everybody at the table and who can adapt to what the players do and who can eliminate things that don't make sense. You know, like sometimes you're playing a video game. There are things that happen that really don't make sense, but that's the way the game's made. When an RPG, it doesn't have to be like that. Cause anytime the rules bring about something that doesn't make sense, the GM can say, okay, we're not doing it that way because that's stupid. Right. Like, like there are just times where you're doing it by the rules, but the result is stupid. And it's like, this isn't how reality works. So even though this is the way the rules say we should do it, we're going to do it this other way because that's what makes sense to me as a GM, as an intelligent, creative, free willed human being, as opposed to a uh, computer program. So, you know, as, as a GM, you, you always have options. And don't be afraid to go outside the box. Don't be afraid to violate what your adventure says you should do. Don't be afraid to go against what the rules say if you if you need to do it. Because um, ultimately, most of your players, that, that's what they're there for. That's what they signed up for. That's why they're playing D&D and they're not playing World of Warcraft or The Witcher 3 or, or some other game like that. They're playing D&D because they want the options that are available to them with a human dungeon master who can adapt on the fly to what they're doing instead of a video game where no matter how many options it seems like you have at any given time, it's a finite, like there's really only so many options because they're all the options that the designers of the game thought of and put into the game. So if you come up with a solution to a problem they didn't think of, you can't do it where if you come up to a solution to a problem that the DM didn't think of, a good DM will let you do it. And it, and a good DM will even reward you because it's like, <laughs> the, the way I think of it, about it a lot of times is like, well, if, if you as a player come up with a solution to the problem I put a, ahead of you that I didn't think of, that's a good solution. It's not some hair-brained, full of holes, stupid idea, but is an, a legitimate good solution that I did not think of. Then I have to think, unless I'm dealing with an NPC who's crazy smart, you know, smart, much smarter than me, I have to think if I didn't think of it, then it's a good chance the NPC didn't think of it either, which means, you know, your method to, to infiltrate this castle is something that maybe no one ever thought of. And, and there's going to be very little resistance because you found a loophole that no one knew about or, or considered. And, and maybe what was going to be this slog of very difficult encounters, you completely bypass entirely because you came up with, with a really good innovative solution. So, you know, in a video game, you just can't do that. You can't come up with a solution the game doesn't anticipate. But in an RPG, that's often the best thing you can do. And you're often very well rewarded for doing it, which is, I think, what, what makes these games op awesome and why I love playing them and why I love running them. So, you know, if, if you happen to be someone who thinks that you know, the GM has to run an adventure exactly as written or a GM has to run the rules exactly as written. 
you know, consider that not only is that not true, but but it's actually that's one of the the main strengths of, of these kind of games that that you can have that kind of fluidity and creativity. And it's what makes them fun ultimately. All right. Well, that is going to wrap it up for episode 180 of Game Master's Journey. And really quickly, I want to uh, uh, again thank Brett and B. Kronos for commenting in our chat room today. And regarding the legendary item uh, discussion, B. Kronos asks, uh, for instance, how would you give a legendary item in a West Marches campaign? Um, so that's a, that's a great question because it might seem, um, at first that it would be hard to do the kind of things I'm talking about with the West Marches campaign, because it's more sandbox. You don't necessarily know where the player characters are going to go. So, you know, I could put the Holy Avenger in, in a dragon's horde and the players never go there and they never find that item. Um, so, you know, one, one thing I would say is that there's an item, that you really want to give a a certain character and you put it somewhere they don't go to just put it somewhere else that they do go to because they don't know where you put it. Right. So, so just put it somewhere else and just make sense that it, that it's there. Um, You know, a great way to give powerful magic items to player characters is have them face an NPC that's using that item. So, you know, Holy Avenger might not be (laughs) the best example because that's usually going to be, uh, wielded by a good aligned paladin. But um, if you had a, a you know, a, another type of item, like, I don't know, like a staff of the Magi, right? It's like, well, come up with an encounter with a, a an archmage who has a staff of the Magi. And, and that's kind of like a double bonus because not only does it completely make sense how that staff of the Magi got into the game and, and uh, assuming the player characters defeat the mage and get the staff, how they came upon it, like it doesn't seem arbitrary at all. Um, they also have to fight against the staff first before they get it as a resource they can use. So they, they get to see its power uh, from the business end, so to speak. So, so that can be pretty cool. Um, you, could, uh, you could have NPCs in the home base that maybe could could uh, loan or give a magic item to a player character. Um, yeah, you know, so so probably what I would do, because that's a really good question, because because you're right, it it's a little more challenging because you don't necessarily know where they're going to go. Um, so you can't plan ahead in that way. But what I would do is I would I would come up with the item. So let's say I come up with a magical bow. And let's say one of the, the characters is a ranger or some other archer character. And I'm, I come up with this really sweet bow that I want this character to have. Um, just kind of like how I've talked about random encounters where I'll come up with these encounters and just kind of keep them in my back pocket to use whenever um, I need them. And, and whenever it's a really good opportunity, I could do the same thing with this bow. So I know I have this magical bow and I know I want to give it to the player character So I just look for an opportunity to do so. So maybe the next uh, encounter they have with someone or something that uses a bow is using that bow or the next uh, site that they explore that has treasure, the the bow is in that treasure um, kind of thing. And you can still foreshadow it. For instance, um, you know, I like using the dream example. You, you could still have that character have dreams about the bow or have a vision of the bow and just not have the dream or the vision reveal where or how they find it or a location or or anything. So they dream about the bow, but they don't know where they're going to find it. And, and so that way you can still foreshadow it, but you still have the freedom to put it wherever you need to put it so that they find it. Another uh, possibility, and and again, you know, a lot of this is kind of tied up in how magic items work in your setting and um, how available they are. 
But another great way to to get a magic item to the player characters is as a as a quest reward. You know, so a lot of times we see, you know, quests where it's like, do this thing for me and I'll give you 50 gold or whatever. But you could have quests where the NPC says, do this thing for me and I'll give you this magic wand or this magic ring or whatever. Now, now of course, you got to figure out how and why that NPC has that item and how and why they're they're willing to part with it. But um, that could be that could be another way to go about it as well. So I, th- I think you can still do it in West Marches, but it, it will take a little bit more uh, thought and creativity um, as far as how you're you're going to do it. Um, an- another possibility, and this is something as far as how I do it or how I've done it in the past and will probably do it in the future, is um, I think a great source for magic items is a powerful patron. So... About that time, you know, player characters get to like mid-level, like, I don't know, like second, third tier play somewhere in there. Um, They start, you know, um, they start uh, drawing attention to themselves. Like people notice movers and shakers in the world, right? So, So they could attract the notice of a powerful NPC, maybe a former adventurer who's retired or a good aligned dragon or an angel or some, some servant of a deity, one of the players worships or one of the player characters worships, um, or I don't know, any kind of powerful character, uh, could take an interest in the, the PCs and maybe send them on quests, maybe have them do things for, for them and then could, could give them magic items, you know? So maybe they, they have a, a powerful patron, um, like say a good aligned dragon, who wants them to go on a quest for, for them and uh, in, to help them on the quest, maybe lets them use some items from, from their personal hoard, some magic items. And, and maybe it's a thing of they tell the PCs, well, you can use these for these quests, but I want them back. But then maybe if the PCs do really well or go above and beyond, maybe the dragon lets them keep them or whatever, or sells them to them or, or something like that. So, so yeah, that's another way you could do it. And that's the way I've commonly done it in the past with really powerful specialized items is, um, a lot of times I'll have a powerful NPC give, give them the item after they do quests for them or whatever. And then, Oh, the final way, um, which is another great way I have used in the past is have an item that will grow with the character and power and let them start out with the item and either they start out and the item isn't magical or doesn't um, function as a magic item yet. If you don't want them to have a magic item at first level or whenever you start, or it just starts out and it's fairly weak, you know, so you could give that paladin that Holy Avenger, but when they get it at first level, it's just, maybe it's just a long sword that's magical. So it doesn't do anything. It doesn't have any bonuses, but it is a magic weapon. So it does get through, you know, damage resistance that that needs magic weapons to get through or, or to hit. But other than that, it doesn't do anything. Or maybe it starts out first level. It's just a plus one longsword. And then as the character levels, it gains more abilities until they're, you know, 20th level or whatever. And it's a full blown Holy Avenger or whatever, whatever the thing is. So so that's another way too. It, that you can do it so that you can um, start them out with an item you want them to have later um, without having to give them a Holy Avenger at first level. And then that way the Holy Avenger can be the ancestral sword of the family. And it makes sense that this character would use this weapon forever and, and never up quote upgrade it. Right. And, And that's a problem that you can have with how the magic items are presented sometimes is it's like, well, what if I have this really cool, character concept where I have this sword that's been in my city, my, my family for generations. It's been handed down, handed down. It's been handed down to me by my father. And like, this is a sword I'm going to use forever. Cause it's my family sword. You know, well, I started out first level character. It's just a plain Jane sword. And throughout my career, I find all these magic swords that are way better mechanically, but for a flavor story reason, I want to use the sword I started with and, and you know, that can be a problem if you approach magic items in certain ways. So, so an easy way to get around all that is to say, 
well, this is a magic sword and it's very powerful, but it, um, it, it, it scales with your power. So it, it kind of amplifies your personal power. So since you're only first level, you don't have a lot of power right now. So it's, the sword isn't very powerful right now, but as you grow more powerful, you will unlock more of that sword's abilities and more of its power will, will be uh, available to you. This works really well with intelligent items because an intelligent item can be like, Hey, you know, I, I don't trust you yet. You haven't proven yourself to me, so I'm not going to give you access to everything I can do. And, and as you earn that items, trust it, it lets you do more and more with it. So, uh, intelligent items can be, can be a great way to approach that too. All right. So I want to thank everyone in the chat today. And I want to thank everyone who's submitted questions and topic ideas and who's been active on our, our community over in Google plus that's where a lot of these topics come from. Um, so thank you very much for all your feedback. I really appreciate it. Um, it, if you want to get a hold of me, if you have topic ideas or feedback or questions, uh, you can shoot me an email, gamemastersjourney at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Lex Starwalker, and you can go to the website, starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Masters Journey, and you can find all my other information there. Um, you can find my, my Pinterest, uh, where I collect fantasy and sci-fi art. Uh, you can find a link to my YouTube channel where I have actual play, uh, actual play games. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, you can also find links to my D and D adventure, the tricksters labyrinth. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's, who's purchased copies of that. Really appreciate it. Um, you can also find a link to our store and spread shirt where you can get a t-shirt um, all that stuff at starwalkerseos.com. You can also find our voicemail number, uh, where you can call and leave me a message. And that is, you know what? I don't have it here. <laughs> that should be in my show notes. Uh, that was neglected. That is 951 GMJ Lex one. That's 951-465-5391. So you can call in and leave a message and I might use your message on the show. You can also send me audio files via email if you prefer. So if you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future topics, I would love to hear from you. Also on the website, you can find our community on Google+. Find a link to that where you can share ideas from with other listener GMs. You can find a link to our Discord server. You can find a link to my Patreon page where you can support the show. Um, you can also support the show by one-time donate donation on the website. You can use my Amazon referral link when you shop on Amazon, uh, get yourself a t-shirt, get my D and D adventure. Um, you can find all the different ways you can support the show at starwalkerstudios.com slash support. So I hope that you have a chance to run your favorite RPG this week. I hope you have a chance to play your favorite RPG this week. I usually say that the other way around. Anyway, I'll be back with another episode soon. Until then, game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production, your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey. 